Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames end the month of February strong, finishing up their long homestand for the month. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, let's jump into this week and talk about uh, the end of, I guess, the the month that wasn't supposed to be. Yeah, well, you know, the Flames were only scheduled to play, I think it was like four or five games this month. They were supposed to play the first two, the Calgary-Dallas, and then I think it was the, what was it, Winnipeg, Vancouver, Minnesota. Yeah, so... We got a free winning streak. Yay. There you go. <laughs> um, let's start with the game that started on the 21st. This was um, the Calgary Flames on Monday night hosting the Winnipeg Jets in the Saldome. And we saw here a 3-1 to one win, not maybe as large as some of the win streaks we've seen in the past, but like the Seattle game, they still found a way to win. Um, Lindholm's late goal helped the Flames defeat the Jets for their 10th in a row. And also speaking of Lindholm, his win streak or his scoring streak continued. He has eight goals in eight games coming out of this one. What were your thoughts on this game? Uh, I thought it was a solid effort. Uh, very much like the Seattle game where like they didn't really give up a ton to Winnipeg and they controlled the play most of the time. The bounces weren't going their way. They had a uh, lot of traffic in front of the net, but couldn't get a lot of those pucks in. Yeah, and it's like you're doing most of the things right, and if you had better puck luck, you'd probably win this game 5, 6, 7, 8, 1. I do agree with that, but I also feel like the Flames didn't have as much urgency in their game as we saw earlier And I agree streak. with that entirely. It's like, yeah, we can just go out there and kick anybody's ass, and, you know... That it, it, we don't have to try that hard, and because we're just running rough shot over everybody. And while that's the case, you still have to do all the little details as well. Yeah, f- no, you, you're right. It's about and sometimes it's about those little details. But you know, the Flames. I thought of the maybe of all the games in this streak, I thought this was probably the maybe the least polished game they've had. Yeah, it was after this one. That I'm like I. Th- think that i have a strong suspicion that the streak's coming the to end an is end near. yeah because we saw that in the la and anaheim game at the beginning of december where like they won both those games and great awesome but like they look terrible during those games and it's like yeah we're gonna go on a losing streak and sure enough they lost like four in a row before covid hit and you know uh, it's one of one of those things that this team uh needed to you know tighten up a bit after especially after the vancouver game uh the first first lindholm goal in this game got called back so it's good that he got another one here and a uh, lineup note in this one lucic and dubé swap spots in the lineup so we saw um at least starting the game we saw lucic on the third line and dubé on the fourth line that'll become a bit of a storyline later and also to fully replace monahan on the first power play unit midway through the game so a few lineup yeah. tweaks for the flames here and honestly, I do not expect Dylan Dubé to get a ton of playing time uh, down the stretch just because of the fact that Daryl likes his veterans and Dubé has been rather inconsistent for, you know, he's been okay. There, uh, there's nothing intrinsically wrong and he's a decent third, fourth line guy. It's just that you he's not overly big, he's not overly physical. And for a third, fourth line guy, it's better to go with the veteran guy who can play the, that physical way and do the things that you need. Well, let's come back to Dubé in a bit. Let's wrap up this week. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else about the Winnipeg game? I think to me we've kind no. of summed it up right there. Yeah, it, it was what it was. You know, they won, but uh, yeah, it was not as convincing. The Flames after that had two days off, and on the 24th, they took a short road trip over to Winnipeg, their first road trip since, or their first road game since the 2nd of February, and uh, (laughs) not a great showing here. When you said you thought the win streak was going to come to an end, it did in a very... And, and, you know, honestly, if you're going to have a win streak like this end, this is like the single best way... Because there's no ambiguity whatsoever. Everybody played like garbage. <laughs> you throw that one in the trash. And yeah. <laughs> so this was a 7 1 Canucks win. They were powered by their 90s. The go- ghosts of the 90s wearing their old black and white and, or black and yellow and red jerseys. 
Yeah. By the way, um, those are my favorite Canucks jerseys, and you know they're the only ones that are not completely hideous. Not the so. gradient ones, Matt. Well, those are odd, more so than bad. They're just weird. But yeah, you know, I I have to admit that I liked sort of the retro throwback from both teams. Vancouver wearing their old jerseys, and Calgary obviously wearing their '80s jerseys now full time. I thought it was a it was a good throwback. Yeah. Definitely reminded me of like 93, 94. Interesting in this one in the first period, we heard and loud enough to be picked up by the TV cameras and the radio as well. The Go Flames Go chants that were pretty loud. Not something I ever expected we'd hear in Vancouver. Yeah, every once in a while you can hear little bits of a Go Canucks Go or Go Oilers Go chant, and then it quickly gets like muted out and deafened out by the other, but yeah, it, that was quite audible. And on an interesting note, the Calgary Flames win streak started at the end of January, January 29th against Vancouver, and it again came to an end in Vancouver here. Um, Honestly, I, this I, game, I, as bad as the score was, for like the first half of the game, honestly, I thought Calgary was the better team and probably should have been up by two or three goals by, you know, like about the halfway point of the game. It's just... Yeah, once the wheels started falling off the wagon, boy, did it just, you know, it blow up on the side of the road. I could agree with you about the first period. I think the teams looked pretty even in the first. As soon as, um, you know, I mean, even by that fourth goal, that Horvat goal, three power play goals in one period, that's when I knew the Flames were in trouble. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, like, it, basically, once it became 2 nothing, it's like, okay, well, we'll see. Then, like, right after three, no- okay, yeah, we're going to see some, yeah, and then, I've, oh, and then, oh. <laughs> I've said for a long time that the Flames get into trouble when they take more pen- penalties than the other team. Penalty minutes this game, 34 Calgary, 2 Vancouver. I think, I think you might have identified the problem there. I'm not too sure. It, it's a little ambiguous. They don't pay me a million dollars to coach this team, but even I know it's wrong. Yeah, it's like, um, guys, uh, you know, if if you're going to take the penalty, take a penalty, <laughs> you know. At least send a message just because. <laughs> First yeah. time the Flames have given up three pe- penalty kill goals this year and um, also saved themselves from another first, which would have been the first time to be shut out. They haven't been shut out yet. Yep, thank you to Manjapane for, you know, keeping that streak alive. Woo. So he had to... Yeah, Manjapani. Comeback uh, is underway. <laughs> you know, 7-1 with like two minutes left. <laughs> Actually, it was funny because as soon as it happened with two minutes left, I saw a few people on Twitter saying, all right, so these guys need a goal every like eight and a half seconds to get back into this one. We can do it. Yep. <laughs> it's like, all right. Honestly, there we go. That- uh, honestly, you know, Vancouver could have just pulled their goalie for the rest of the game. I still don't think the Flames would have tied it. <laughs> That's that sounds like the end of an Air Bud movie or something. Like um, that would not be like lo- the ultimate taunt. You, you know, we're just so far up on you. We're just pulling your goalie. Have fun. <laughs> well, we'll get we'll give you the the empty net to shoot on for two minutes. Yep. And after this game, Daryl Sutter, I think, comments his comment that I think um, some things up really well is he said he wants more gritty and less pretty going forward. Well, and that. Uh, loops back to what I was saying about Dylan Dubé, who is a solid player, but like he he does everything okay. It's just that for the role that he's being asked to play on the fourth line, like the Flames do have better options. And so that's why I think that, you know, it might be a while before you see Dubé on the ice again. And that bared to be true in the Saturday night game, the Hockey Night in Canada game, when the Flames took on the Minnesota Wild. The Flames made a, actually two guys out and two guys in. Dubé and Rajishka both came out of the lineup as healthy scratches. In their place, Richie and Richardson were in the lineup. I think that kind of goes to what you're talking about, a more, let's call it a more traditional-looking fourth line with those yeah. guys in there. Well, and honestly, like when it comes time for the playoffs and such, because... Uh, I think the team is treating the two Minnesota games as kind of like a play- mini playoff ga- series. Um, you know, you're going to probably see that kind of a deployment, whether it's Lucic on that line or, you know, 
the three that were out there, like some permutation of that as your fourth line, just so, so that the fourth they can line go last night was bang. Lewis Richardson and Richie. Yeah, and I think that you'll see them going out and crashing and banging and hitting anything that moves in the playoffs and trying to get energy any way possible. And the Flames win this Minnesota game 7-3, to three, and it sounds like a big win, but honestly, Matt, in the third, when it got to be 5-3, I was standing up in the press box going, uh, <laughs> these guys could let this win go. Like it, Minnesota was just coming back into it so hard at that point that I thought I'm constantly looking at the ice and glancing at the clock being like, yeah, there's time for Minnesota to get back into this. Yeah. I think that uh, the Shillington play uh, might have just shaken the team for a few minutes, and uh, you know, once they well, let's talk about that in the thir- third period. Oliver Shillington took a big hit into the boards. He was on the ice for probably 20 30 seconds. The first time in a long time I've seen a hit like that for the Flames and had to be helped off the ice after the game. Uh, Daryl Sutter said that he's fine, and Matthew Kachuk said he seems to be fine. Um, when he saw him in the room, do you think that I mean? I don't know. I I don't look at Daryl as the guy, as sort of the barometer for players that are fine or not. I think Daryl... Well, honestly, him and, like, the Iraqi information minister have a lot in common in terms of, you know, yeah, he's fine, you know, he's alive. Daryl kind of reminds me of my grandpa, that if, you know, all your limbs were there and you weren't bleeding, you were fine. Yes, everything is fine. So, I... It would be interesting to see if Shillington plays the next game. And um, it, actually, if you look at the Flames' salary cap, they don't have enough money to bring somebody up without sending somebody down, like uh, Ruzicka. So I think if they aren't going to play Shillington, I think that Stone's going to have to draw in the lineup. Which isn't the worst thing in the world, but it's certainly not ideal either. Um, yeah, I think that like it, it, if... Uh, both Mackey and Valimaki played today in Abbotsford, so it's not likely that they will be joining the Flames for a Tuesday game in Minnesota. I I think that like if you're gonna see that kind of a transaction, it'll be tomorrow on Monday, um, in the morning, and you know, like Rajitska sent down and Mackey or Valimaki called up. Which, and even in that, yeah. even in that case, I don't know if that guy gets to Minnesota for the game. I could see him playing Stone for that one, and then having that defenseman meet them back home for the Montreal game. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, if technically, if you want to do that, and and I know they probably don't know yet, but those guys are in Vancouver. They're almost better, or in Abbotsford, they'd almost be better fly that player to Calgary, meet them there, and then fly them to Minnesota from there. It'll be interesting to see exactly how that all shakes out i i'm hopeful that shillington might just need to you know like the day off and you know like he like hurt his shoulder more so than you know his head then you and, know and and it's not playoffs i don't want them to rush him back if he needs the time especially for how important he's been to this team if he needs the time yeah. i'd rather they find a solution um yeah. and keep him out of lineup for a couple games yeah, and like honestly, either Mackey or Valimaki could slot into that spot uh, and play adequately for a game or two or three. You know, Andy if... Walensky. Uh, well, and, uh, then, then you're, you know, it's like, uh, Oliver, get better soon. <laughs> I'm looking at who else we have uh, access Indeed. to Nick D. Simone. Or Kirkland, yeah. Kevin Gravel. Um, those are those are the other possible veteran options. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's gonna have to be Mackie or Valimaki. But I think I don't know. I feel like you kind of. I feel like Stone is good enough that for a game or two he can probably take that that spot on. I mean, when was the last time Michael Stone played a bad game? Yeah. When we bought him out. And, <laughs> well, I think that was more just a salary. Oh, I thing. know. But, you know, like, th- that was, like, the last time that he was kind of waffling. He's been serviceable ever since. And with this win over Minnesota, the Calgary Flames now have, they've ended their winning streak uh, for games in a row, but they now have a franchise, they tie a franchise record for 11 home wins in a row, and they'll have a chance next month to extend that win streak quite a bit here. Um, Matt, let's... Before we get on to this, one more question about this Minnesota game. Did you expect the Flames would win by that much of a margin? Yes, I did. Yeah, because, against Minnesota? Uh, 
yeah, how would you say, because of the fact that uh, Vancouver was so... Uh, you know, it was not a 2-1 close game where the goalie stood on his head. Like, everybody screwed up that game. That, you know, this team has the... For the first time in a long while, the ability to get really angry and direct that anger properly. And... You know, and you saw that in that Minnesota game. They were just hitting every single thing. Well, I was surprised how much animosity there was there for teams that didn't play at all last year. Like these teams have barely seen each other in the last couple of years. How how much yeah animosity there was. Well, and I think that's why the Flames were treating like this two game set against Minnesota as a playoff series, as a tune up for it, because of the fact that you know, like Minnesota could very well be a team that they face in the first round as one of the two wild card teams. And, you know, you're needing to be able to assert your dominance over them. And, you know, we saw that, like, the Flames were targeting Kaprizov the entire game, and he took a couple of penalties because of that. And, you know, you're just having to throw everything at them. And uh, I was surprised by the physicality we saw from Manjibani. Yeah. Well, you know, he was uh, channeling another shorter former flame in that game. Definitely saw a lot of Theo Fleury in his game in that one. Spicy bread. Yes. (laughs) Jalapeno bread is what we saw in that one. Yep. Um, But that, I guess, of all the guys that we sort of saw pushing and shoving all game, Manjipani was the most surprising to me. Yeah, but um, that also bodes well especially for the playoffs that like a guy like him who is a little on the smaller side is not going to get pushed around and is just as willing to punch people in the face like he did with Spurgeon you know and wrestle with people you know and okay fine you want to go that way fine let's go and you need to have that like all for one attitude and you know like the ability to pick up guys like Backlund or Coleman if they're getting into rough stuff as well yeah, for sure. And I think the fact that the Flames dressed who they dressed on the fourth line kind of told you they were expecting this kind of game. Yeah. And this is, you know, like, frankly, with all of the acquisitions this past off season, with getting all of these very big, very physical guys, this is exactly the type of game that I've been waiting for. And, you know, you're starting to see, like, and you'll probably see over the next couple of months as the games start getting more you know because it naturally gets more up tempo towards the end that uh you're gonna start to see you know the dividends of having like five or six guys that are all like six three and up that'll just hit like a freight train you know like there was that one play uh that good Branson did in the neutral zone where he edged off the one wild player who had the puck and crashed him right into the boards. The puck went to the other wild player and then Zadorov absolutely creamed that guy too. And it's like you, the last time that we really saw like that level of physicality from the flames was when Furland and, and company were having fun against Vancouver in 14, 15. And on, you know, sort of seeing the rewards of new players coming in, I think that, and Brad Living mentioned this when he made the deal, but bringing Tyler Toffoli in early gave him time to get adjusted and acclimatize the team. Toffoli got two goals and assists, three points in the night in this one. And I'm hoping that that's sort of Tyler now showing that, okay, he's, he's comfortable here, he knows his role, and we'll start seeing more offense from him. Well, and the, that's the good thing about having the amount of depth that we do is that, like, he, him playing on the third line, um, it he's facing lesser defensemen five on five, and then he gets to go play with the first line on the power play. And, you know, like, they did uh, mention it during the broadcast of how they have Lindholm and Toffoli in two different spots on the right side of the goalie, um, setting up for one timers, one high, one low, and they're both on the the strong side to shoot for a one timer, which gives guys like Gaudreau and Kachuk, who also are set for one timers on that side, uh, options, you know, both ways to take slap shots. And, you know, like you saw with the Toffoli goal, 
like that kind of a thing working very well on that aspect and you know it, it'll be interesting to see moving forward um like how much more dangerous that this power play becomes with that game, the Flames now sit atop the Pacific Division still with 68 points. Second place is uh, the Los Angeles Kings at 65 points, and Vegas at 62, and Edmonton at 61. The only two teams ahead of us in the West, we're now third in the West, are St. Louis at 70, so just barely above us, and Colorado at 82 points. So uh, uh, a pretty good uh, pretty good month for the Flames, and they have 64 points available to them in the remainder of the season. If they go 500 the rest of the way, they'd finish with 99 points in the season. I think Daryl's always said you kind of need 100 to get in, which they'll, they're will they going to do better than 500. So more than enough to get them to the dance. And as you and I have talked about during this win streak, it's about putting together a bit of a cushion, and they definitely have, have an impressive cushion now coming out of February. Yeah, and frankly, um, this team needs to, um, and like you're starting to actually see a little bit of it, and getting that swagger of, yeah, we are the da- best damn team in this division, and we're going to be going far in the playoffs, and if you want to beat us, bring it, <laughs> you know, and that kind of swagger that this team has like that's frankly hasn't been around in a long 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 time (laughs) like 30 years long you know like this team has you know like it it's good to see that you know like they're basically looking at each opponent and saying okay yeah you're doing that great we're gonna hit you now (laughs) and not care and (laughs) Like, Minnesota's a very good team, and yet, like, they just completely ran roughshod over them. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. They're playing like... They're, they're not playing like a middle team that's getting lucky and getting wins. They're starting to look like a team that is actually destined to go far. Yeah. You're lo- basically, like, they're starting to have, like, the same type of swagger that teams like Chicago and Boston and Pittsburgh who from like 10 years ago who are like perennially the the best teams and like the teams to beat they're they have that kind of energy around them right now and you know and the results speak for themselves like every game practically they're completely out shooting and outclassing the opposition and you know when you win 11 out of 12 games you know that's kind of indicates that you're doing something some a few things right One guy who's not doing some things right is Dylan Dubé. As you mentioned earlier, he's out of the lineup. He wasn't doing what the coach wanted. And um, this is, I think, an interesting story here. I think a lot of fans, I know you've been a Dubé fan for a while. I think a lot of fans are really high on him, maybe because of his draft position, maybe he's that homegrown talent. But he's he's out of the lineup. I think I agree with you that I think he'll stay out of the lineup for a while. But as a 23-year-old making $2.3 million with three years left, what do you think Dubé's future with the Flames is? Well, and that's where it'll be interesting to see. Like, I think we can agree he's having a disappointing year. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that like he is doing certain things better than he has been. Like He has been better defensively this year. Um, and he, he's more consistently doing the little things right. It's just that offensively, he's been bad for most of the year. Part of that's due to having Brett Ritchie on his line for a good portion of the season. But, you know, it, it's one of those things that he need. I think that, frankly, um, like how the Flames sat Oliver Shillington last year and basically made him watch the whole season. You know, I think that uh, having... Dubé up in the press box and say watch what these people are doing and learn and you know because sometimes you need to remove yourself from the actual on ice and be able to visualize the game better and I think that just having him take some time off to regroup I think and then you know like when they do deploy him I think he'll be hungry to 
in press. So you know, it, it, it'll be just interesting to see. But I think that like there at this point, there's no two point three million is a lot more than Schillinger's making though. I mean, that's an expensive contract to park. Oh, I know, and. That's one of those things that, like, I'm expecting him to be a lot better next season regardless. Um, but, you know, like, frankly, like, this season, he's been worth about 1.6, 1.7 for and what he's brought. It's just that, you know, like, as you said, 2.3 is a lot. And, in, you know, he needs to figure out a way to be more in every way and you know like there have been too many games where pucks have bounced on them or you know just little mistakes that cause problems that screw up offensive chances and it's just i think dubay's an nhl player but i wonder what his future with the flames are i mean if i look at this lineup our top six is johnny goudreau elias lindholm matthew gachuk blake coleman Mikel Backlund, Andrew Mangiapane. I don't see him usurping any of those guys. No. If we look at the bottom six, we have Monaghan to Foley on a line, which where Dubé's been playing a lot. Then we've got Lucic, Lewis, Richardson, Richie to make up that last line. When I look at that line with um, Monaghan and to Foley, which they're putting a lot of money into and assuming those guys stay next year, I think you could do better for the same money. I mean, I look at a guy like Nikushkin or Nemesnikov or... You know, Zach Sanford, all these guys. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, Yarn Krog. I mean, I'm just looking at guys that are UFAs. Yeah, Um, well, he is too, that's why. Yeah, he is. Um, You know, guys, you know, even like a Josh Archibald. um, Yeah. You know, like, I just, I think you could fill that, a Derek Steppen. Like, I feel like you could fill that role similarly with a more veteran guy who might be able to do the same thing. So it makes me wonder, like, is Dylan Dubé's time as a flame coming to an end is he more valuable as a trade piece well and that's the thing like if the flames can go out and acquire somebody at a, at the deadline um in order to make the dollars work uh, a guy like dubay might need to be included and would you even that... be willing to move dubay for a pick to recoup some picks possibly um Again, it would de- it would largely depend on the who's and the what's. Um, like if you're getting, like I'm just gonna because of repetition, say ca- get Cal Yarncroc in the deal, right? Uh, if you're doing that, then you know, just role wise, you know, Dubay spots kind of gone at that point, permanently. Uh, so then, you know, going out and getting say a third for Dubay from you know some rebuilding team that's not bad value and i think as a team that's going to need every dollar they can get for you know money this summer i don't know if i would move dubé for a pick at the deadline i think that you know he's a guy that's valuable enough as an extra body come playoff time but i could see that being a draft day deal well and that's where like if um like say you're you're wanting to get like a four or five million dollar contract at the deadline, uh, and like another guy of Toffoli's caliber, say, and you need just need the dollars to work. Like the the other team will eat some of the contract. You might have to throw in a guy like Dubé, even if you're getting an asset back, like a fourth or a fifth, in the deal for whomever that would be. And you know that might be a situation where, you know, utilizing the dollars and the asset for something that's a clear upgrade because like if you could get like a similar ish guy to to fully on that line then like <laughs> yeah you're good yeah i mean i'm not expecting they're gonna get another to fully like player at least not at the deadline and i think you and i talked about it a little bit we'll talk more about the deadline come march but i think if i'm looking at the guy i want to put on that line with monahan to fully i want someone with a little more veteran presence i don't you know i don't think they yeah. need to be to level but You know, somebody who's a little bit more of a a veteran on that line. And, you know, I mean, at that point, if Dubé does fall to the third line, I mean, with, you know, what, Lucic at six and Dubé at 2.3, that's 8.3 million. So let's call it nine by the time you had somebody else in it. That's an expensive fourth line. Yeah. Um, So I, I think... 
I would not be surprised to see Dubé and Valimaki even move together in an off-season deal. Yeah, and that could very well be. But I just, I also, I mean, when when Daryl Sutter came in, one of the guys when I looked around the roster that I thought is not going to do well under Daryl Sutter is Dylan Dubé. Like he just, he's not a Sutter style player, and I thought maybe we'd get that out of him. And I think you've you you said earlier he's looking better in some areas. But I just don't think he's a Daryl Sutter player. And we see this in every team, right? They bring in a new yeah. coach and one or two guys just don't gel and we get rid of them or that team yeah. gets rid of them. So I think this might be a case where Dubé is a serviceable NHLer. He's just not a Daryl Sutter NHLer. Yeah. And it, it's one of those things where it will largely depend, you know, like it's like you look at, uh, say, like a team like a San Jose who's in the midst of a rebuild ish. You know, like, they might want to shed Hurdle's contract or something like that. And, yeah, like, it, it's frustrating that, like, Dubé has struggled. But, like, frankly, like, with where the Flames are at in terms of their overall placing, um, it's, they're very much more in a put-up-or-shut-up type zone. And... You know, like if uh, a guy like um, Dubé is, you know, like even though he's a young player, if he's not contributing in a top nine fashion, it's like, well, we just don't have space for you to figure things out. And we saw that a lot with teams like Chicago and Boston, where they would have to deal out decent players that were just, you know... Or like Tampa, like with Nemestikov, as you mentioned earlier, like uh, they had to get rid of him just because they couldn't afford to keep him as well. And like I'm know. just looking if we're if we're looking for sort of the you know the cheap third fourth line guy because again I think this team's going to be looking for every dollar they can get. I could even see you know you mentioned Hurdle like I could even see a team in the draft saying okay by this point we know we're not bringing somebody else back so we want some assurance we'll take on the two point three million and I think Calgary would would very easily shed some you know be happy to shed two point three million off their books yeah um, he's you know he's a good player but I just I don't know what his future is in Calgary and I think that this. Uh, well, I guess we'll see what happens with him in the coming few weeks here, but I think that this move could signal... I don't want to say the end. I don't want to say he'll never play for the Flames again, but I think this is sort of Daryl Sutter showing his hand. Yeah. Well, and especially, like, as, as like I was mentioning earlier, like, this team is kind of gearing up for the playoffs, and certain players have certain roles. And, you, you know, like, if you just look at Dubé himself, like, he is not better as a fourth liner than the guys that were put in the lineup ahead of him the other day. No, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that he has a... I mean, he's a bona fide Ancheller. And I think yeah. that that's the reason you might see him last through the trade deadline because he's a reliable body if somebody goes down between, you know, the 21st and the Stanley Cup Finals, however long the Flames last. Um, but I, I just I don't know that I'm less convinced now than I was before that Dylan Dubé is going to have a long that he will see this contract through as a flame. Yeah. What about Adam Rajishka? Also scratched there. He's still waiver eligible. Do you think that we'll see Rajishka stay up here with the team, or do you think that they will, or do you think Daryl Sutter will say, okay, we know we got, send him back? Uh, could be, uh, especially like if they need to recall a defenseman. I think that they will send him down. Um, Rajitska has been good. Um, no real complaints. Uh, uh, again, uh, he's a little on the passive side, uh, for a fourth line role. Um, but you know, uh, I th honestly, Man, I think he, he brings more Hold to the on. lineup at this point than D Dubé does. But, uh, yeah, I think it's just a numbers game. And like, I, I think that uh, Daryl especially trusts the veteran guys more than the first year pros, um, like uh, Ruzitska, who you know, like, would I expect Ruzitska to be a full time player next year? Definitely. Same with Peltier, but I, uh, I just, I don't, uh, 
I think that, you know, like him finishing off the season strong in Stockton might be better for both him and the team, frankly. Yeah, and just because the Flames are so close to the salary cap, uh, you know, the the top end of the cap, I could see them sending him down for a little bit. I mean, if they are going to get Yarn Croak or anybody, any any other player, they need to shed some salary. So I could see them sending him down even just to, you know, make that work. And like you said, then penciling him in for next year. But I, I don't think that this is necessarily a knock on Rajichka. I think this is sort of, you know what, you're still the call-up. Um you know, you're we're going to take you out for a game or two, and I think as a rookie, that's to be expected when you're playing on the bottom six. Yeah. Let's move ahead then from sort of the week that was to what's coming up, and let's take a look at the March schedule. The Flames are back to their regular scheduled games coming up in March, and um, these are again the games that we are anticipating them playing in March. A much busier schedule than February, and the Flames are essentially playing almost every other day, but still a lot of home games. Home is where the wins are for the Flames, as we're seeing, and only four games on the road in March, all of which are only one-day trips. Like, you know, they play Minnesota and they're back. They play Colorado and then they're back in Calgary. They play Colorado again and they're back in Calgary, and they play Vancouver and they're back in Calgary. But as much as they're all one-game um, away trips or road trips, two of them run back-to-back. So we're going to be here and then go to Colorado, then here and go to Vancouver, so still a little bit of, I guess, pressure travel in, in those road swings. Um, Matt, you you had some you had an interesting idea earlier before we started recording of how you'd break this month down. Well, uh, this month's schedule, uh, it clearly breaks into two halves. Like the first half of the month uh, between now and March 13th, the Flames are playing eight games and seven of which are against very good playoff teams. Um, Minnesota, Colorado twice, Edmonton, Washington, Tampa, and even though they're not in the playoffs, they're close in the East with Detroit. Uh, the lone lesser opponent is Montreal, and you know, like there's just not really a lot of room for this team to, you know, they they're playing good team after good team after good team. And, you know, not only not only that, but when I look at this schedule, the first half of the month to me is very Eastern weighted. Like we've got Montreal, Washington, Tampa Bay, Detroit. The second half of the and, – and even let's go New Jersey right to the 16th. The second half of the month is very Western weighted. We've got Vancouver, San Jose, Arizona, Edmonton, Colorado, L.A. So I think if this team is going to – give up points in this month i think you've got to do it in the first half because i mean you don't want to give up points divisionally or if you can avoid it uh in the conference but even the second half i think san jose edmonton colorado and la i mean those are four opponents that you know we don't want to be giving points up to no and to me like the three single biggest and most important games this month are on the 5th the 13th and the 29th the uh, three colorado, colorado games yeah and like, if Calgary fulfills their destiny as, like, the team that's going to come out of the Pacific Division and go to the Western Conference Finals, more than likely, they're going to be playing the Colorado Avalanche. At some point. You know, as, like, the Central Division champion. So, you know, like, would it be awesome if the Flames played Nashville, St. Louis, or Minnesota instead? Of course. But... You know, just based off of everything that we've seen from Colorado this season, they're going to be going to the Western Conference Finals. So, those three games in particular, to me, are like the ones to set the tone and, you know, hopefully win two or or maybe uh, all three of them just to, you know, set the tone so when and if the Flames get to face the avalanche again you know they're more ready than last time do you think i think that is and i've talked to a couple avalanche fans who really don't think at all about the flames but i think we tend to think more about the avalanche because of the you know the the world defeat that we had there i feel like like you said that's sort of it would do us justice to beat them in the playoffs but i think that as flames fans those are probably more important to us than they are to them Oh, for sure, because they, like, completely pants the Flames yeah. uh, last time. So 
yeah, of course they don't care about Calgary because, you know, they were the ones that completely embarrassed us. So, yeah, of course. And I think when we look at those two games or those three games and we put them in with the, um, yeah, I, I mean, the playoff teams that we're playing this month, um, you know, Edmonton, L.A., uh, Tampa Bay, like I think the Flames, this is going to be the month so far they can really show if they're a playoff competitor. I, I would like to see them win those Colorado games. I don't know if they'll win all three, but I think they at least need to be competitive. And I think that's going to be the, to me, the story of the month in March is these guys need to show that they can play playoff hockey. In playoffs, you don't win every game, right? If we, no. I mean, it's best of seven. And I think that you know, even if we are competitive against Colorado and don't beat them, I think to me that's going to be the most important thing. If we're competitive against Tampa Bay, if we're competitive against Edmonton, if we're competitive against, you know, L.A., if we're competitive against Minnesota, like, I think this team just needs to really show that they can hang with the big boys at this point. Yeah, and, like, with the eight games uh, segment coming up uh, between now and the 13th, uh, frankly, like, the Flames at worst need to go... uh, four and four uh through that stretch so let's talk about those teams that's at minnesota versus montreal at colorado versus edmonton versus washington versus tampa versus detroit versus colorado yeah like uh, there are six games against playoff teams two against non-playoff teams and the fact that they're at home, I mean, this team's been doing so well at home, and the fact that the Dome will be full again on the third, um, I think that's really going to help the the momentum for the Flames as well. Yeah, and, like, this, you know, especially, like, with, uh, like, that, for uh, the Minnesota game that just happened, like, this team needs to kind of, like, f- fulfill their... Um, goal of being the the team to beat and you know um and just like completely outclassing other teams like they need to not really like oh you're washington oh you're tampa that's great good for you and we're just gonna play our game and you know you have to deal with us and be that level of assertive which you know at times has been a little lacking, but less so this season. I don't know why I would say that is they can't get intimidated by the top teams. No, and they have to just, you know, because frankly, like, this team is built to win a Stanley Cup. And in order to do that, you have to actually beat the other teams that are also going for the Stanley Cup, like the Colorados, like the Tampas, like Mm -hmm. the Floridas. And, you know, um... It'll be tough, of course, but you know you you're it, like that's the whole point of the season is to test yourself and push yourself. So that way, like even if like they drop the games to Colorado, take those lessons and learn from it to make those adjustments. So that way, if you do meet them in the postseason, you stand a better shot. And you can take those lessons into the next games that month or the next teams. Like This is, I think, the most trying month for this team. Uh, if we, we won't look ahead to April now, but April's a much easier schedule. Well, yeah, uh, six of the 15 games in April are against teams that are currently in the postseason. So it's a very easy month compared to this one. And this one's got a lot of home hockey. And my worry on this one is with such short road swings, like one-game road swings, that the team is going to get tired on the road. Like, you know, I think sometimes when you're on the road for, uh, you know, a week, you sort of learn to endure it and your body gets into a habit. But when you're just going on a quick road trip and home and you're playing so much at home, I worry that the Flames might struggle with these four road games. Well, and that's the uh, thing about April as well, is that the, they're basically playing on the road for a good portion of the month. So uh, while they're playing a lot at home right now, like that will get corrected, I think, uh, heading into April. Because like, they have the California plus Seattle trip, plus a two-game trip, and then another three-game trip to end the season. So... You know, um, like, yes, it's a concern, but less so just due to how things shake out next month. And because the Flames have some tricky games this month with, you know, Tampa Bay, with Colorado, I think 
and, and this is probably going to sound like hockey 101, but you have to win the games that you have to win. Like Montreal, Buffalo, you have to win those games. You've got to oh, yeah. you got to get those two points and and build up that buffer because I think I'll be honest, man. I think the Flames are going to struggle in March. I don't think it's going to be a storybook month like February's been. And I think that they're going to face adversity. And we might even see a two- or three-game losing streak here. So I think, you know, these guys really need to pad their, their you know, their record where they can here. Yeah, well, when you're playing 16 games in 31 days, you know, like, you're going to be tired, and, you know, like, yes, uh, at times we're playing bad teams like Buffalo. But, you know, like, there's some back-to-backs. There's three separate, four separate ones. And, you know, like, as you said, the games against the bad teams, they need to find a way to squirrel those points away. And, you know, because it's going to be tough. Like, it, you know, frankly, like, if you take the... Um, Minnesota, Washington, Tampa, and three Colorado games. Like, you know, those are six games against elite teams. You know, Calgary, like, if they go three and three out of those six games, like, that would be a minor miracle just because of, like, how much we're playing and, you know, the caliber of opponents. When I look at this month, I see Montreal, Buffalo, Arizona, maybe San Jose, that are not great teams, and I think Vancouver that there's too. yeah, and New Jersey. yeah. I, I wouldn't put them in there for the sake of what I'm about to argue, but sure. I think those teams that I was just uh, that I just mentioned the Montreal, Arizona, um, you know, Buffalo, maybe San Jose, I, and those are all prime starts for Dan Vladar. And I think that we haven't seen Dan Vladar play a lot since you know the calendar turned to 2022. I think that there's, I mean, with, you know, so many back-to-backs and so many games that we should be winning, I think we're going to see a lot more Dan Vladar in March. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, uh, I'm, like, honestly, I'm expecting the Montreal, the Washington, uh, the Buffalo game, uh, the Arizona game. Montreal makes sense. Um, Washington's a second of a back-to-back, so that makes sense. Buffalo's the first of a back-to-back, but that makes sense. Uh, Even the... The, Col- the second Colorado game I could see Vladar getting. You know, I wouldn't be opposed to that because I think switching looks on them would be good. I think when you're playing the three times in a month, they're going to scout your goalies to so swap goalies. Yeah. Well, and plus the night before, they played Detroit, so it's better to get bank the two points for sure and then, you know, throw Vladar to the Wolves and say, have fun. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I, you know, and I, I might even, I think, I could see Sutter playing, um playing Markstrom for both of those games, Detroit and Colorado, and then maybe giving Vladar, you know, one... I, I, I could... If the Flames are doing really well, I could actually see Vladar playing Buffalo and Vancouver, both back-to-backs. Yeah. If well, it'll be interesting well. to see exactly how they manage the ice time, because, like, there's absolutely no way that Markstrom's going to be playing... Uh, like 14 or 15 of the 16 games. Well, like, knowing that we're playoff bound at this point, like I think we can all agree we may not be number one, but the Flames are going to the postseason. Like there's yeah. going to have to be an epic fail at this point for them to not go to the postseason. Mm. Um, I think that we have to start looking ahead to managing Markstrom's time, and you play him a lot when you're trying to get in there. Yeah, but then now that we're in, you've got to ease up a little bit. Yeah, and like that's where like. Uh, like the back-to-back with Detroit and Colorado, it's like you put Markstrom in against the team that you're likely going to get the two points, uh, which is Detroit, and you're kind of throwing the Avalanche game without throwing the Avalanche game. And, you know, see how it goes, basically. How's New Jersey doing this year? I don't even know where they they're, are in this They're days. mediocre. I know they're so, not in the playoff spot. And all so the that, that could be bad. a way... That could be a something you do, too, is you put... Uh, Markstrom in Detroit and Colorado, and then give Markstrom the week off. Since she put Vladar in New Jersey and Buffalo, but we'll yeah. see. We're we're not the goalie coach. We're not making those decisions. Yeah. But I just I feel like this month you've got to get Dan Vladar going again, if you're gonna you know give Markstrom some time, and you can't keep using Markstrom at the rate we are. No, like there are 31 games remaining between now and the end of April. Like, frankly... I think Mark, you can play 20 of those max. Yeah, I was going to say 22 would be, like, my upper limit. And, 
you know, like it, and that's a heavy workload uh, for you know, like eleven games in a month is a lot for any goaltender. And I think the April schedule, we won't get into it now, but I think the April schedule is a lot easier to play more Vladar. You got two Seattle games, you got um, Arizona, um, you know, Chicago, Winnipeg, Dallas, like teams that you might be able to play those guys again, or you might be able to play Vladar against. But I think March is going to be interesting because they're still trying to bank those points. But yeah, I mean, you've, you've got to rest Marky at some point, especially with them essentially playing every other day. Yeah, it, it'll be... A- a tough thing to manage but you know uh, Daryl's done a decent enough job thus far it's just uh, yeah we just have to wait and see like it, it'll be tough because uh, like especially for the next two weeks like they're, you're playing top teams every night basically so you know uh, we'll see well, Matt, let's look a little bit further ahead than March, and let's talk about the NHL awards. And obviously, these are generally, uh, I don't know if they've announced a date this year, but they're always in June. They've been Vegas the last couple of years. I think that with the Flames looking as good as they are, it's likely that we might see a number of Flames taking home hardware this year. I'm going to throw out some ideas I have for this, and you tell me if you think you agree with these or someone else that might take home hardware. Yep. Um, when I look at the definitions of the awards... I don't think you can give the Jack Adams trophy, which is uh, the, let me just read it here, awarded to the NHL coach judged, uh, adjudged to have contributed the most to his team's success. I don't think uh, there's anybody yeah. in the league but Daryl Sutter you can give that to. The only one that would be close would be Rod Brindamore and win Carolina, and I, yeah, no, it, this is Daryl's award. Brindamore won it last year with Carolina. I don't think that their roster's changed enough that you could say that he's the reason for that success. True. But like, I think when I look at the Flames roster, it's pretty much the same team as last year, at least the big core. Yeah. And, in, in fact, you could even say on paper it's worse having lost Giordano, and yet they've made significant changes under their coach. Like, I think when we look at the coach who's most – there's certain teams you and I could could coach Tampa Bay and they'd still be good, um, yeah. but but I think when we look at the coach who we can directly tie to the team's success, Daryl Sutter's the only guy. Yeah, I agree. Especially the Flames make it past the first round because I mean nobody's got us past the first round in a while, so I think that's really what'll seal his deal. Is you know Kenny gets past the first round. Well, and the, the, that award is uh, uh, named, like, the voting is, like, after the regular season and but before the playoffs. So, um, whatever happens in the postseason is just, you know, purely on Daryl. <laughs> and Daryl would be the second Sutter to win that. He's never actually won it before, but his brother Brian has. Brian was the uh, winner in 1990-91 with St. Louis. So, it would be nice for Daryl Sutter, a storied uh, coach, I'm surprised he's never won it before. Yeah. And frankly, like, Sutter's a Hall of Fame coach, so, you know, it would make sense. It's sort of like Brodeur not winning, like, a Vezina until he was, I think, like, 34 or 35. It's like, um, how? Well, let's Have go there with the, with the Vezna. I think, again, our, our starting goaltender, Jacob Markstrom, is making a strong case for the Vezna Award, which is awarded to the league's top goaltender. Yeah, I think that the difference and, like, the reason why he's a shoe-in versus other guys who have slightly better stats is that eight shutouts. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, like, when you're doubling up second on in the league in shutouts, when, like, that's, like, the key goalie stat for, you know, like, for, like, exceptional goaltending, I, yeah... Markstrom, I think, is the runaway favorite for the. And looking well. ahead at the schedule, I don't think he's going to stop at eight. Like I can see him getting a no. double digits. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up pushing for that record of fifteen for the team. Yeah, I um, can see that. You know, we we're already at ten, so like you know, uh, five between now and the end, I wouldn't be shocked. And I think when I look at other goalies too, like. Here in Calgary, we like our, our players, and we, we think we have a good defensive core. But if you look around the league, we have a very inexperienced defensive core, a lot of young guys. And I think that there's something to be said, too, of Jacob doing this without you know, a lot of, let's call them established veterans in front of him. Uh, yes, but... I'm not saying that know. they're not as good, but I think when it comes to voting, a lot of people look at names. True. And, you know... For how, you know, and I'm just going to go there for a minute. 
Um, how this defensive grouping, um, after losing Giordano, has played this season has been absolutely nothing short of remarkable, and all six of those defensemen deserve a huge amount of kudos for how amazing they've been this season. Like, even guys that, like, when we got them were kind of poo-pooed by a majority of Flames fans with Nikita Zadorov and Erika Branson. Like, those guys have become quite the, you know, uh, frankly, with how they've played, like, they're outperforming some team's first-line defensemen, or first-pairing defensemen. So, yep. you know, uh, like, it, it, for as much as Markstrom's been good this season, th- the defense, uh, you know, they deserve a lot of credit as well. All six of them have been nothing short of spectacular. I agree, but that's kind of what I mean. Like, we've kind of got this ragtag group of defensemen, and when you look at what Jacob's doing behind that group, it's very impressive. Um, the last Flames goalie, of course, to win this was Mika Kiprasov in 5 6 won the Vesna Trophy. And one last trophy I'm going to throw out there is the Hart Memorial Trophy. The Hart Memorial Trophy is awarded to the player judged most valuable by his team. And I can see this definitely going to Johnny Goudreau. Again, I think if we sort of look at, you know, teams out there, I can't think of another team right now who has been taken on the back of one player as much as the Flames have been taken on the back of Goudreau this year. Yeah. Uh, Again, another runaway favorite for the, the award. The Flames have um, never had a Hart Memorial Trophy winner. No, and I think that this is the year that that'll change. And I'm going to add one, you know, because I'm reading your notes here. I'm going to add one more name to your list. Sure. And that will be the Selkie Trophy, and I think there is another shoe in for uh, Elias Lindholm. So the Selkie right. Trophy is awarded to the forward who best, defel- best excels in the defensive aspects of the game. Yeah. Because the Flames' first line has been by far the best line in hockey, and he has been the linchpin defensively on that line. Not saying that Kachuk and Gaudreau haven't been carrying the water. They certainly have, but Lindholm has been spectacular defensively, allowing the other two guys room to create more havoc. The Selkie Trophy is uh, voted on by a poll by the Professional Hockey Writers Association, so I can definitely see that. I think... There's a lot of people who didn't know who Lindholm was, you know, he, playing over here in Calgary. And this year, I think he's definitely getting some notice. So I could definitely see him getting that one. Yeah. And usually that award goes to, like, who is the best defensive high scoring forward? And, you know, and like Lindholm uh, hitting that eight goals in eight games streak, I think, uh, helped to alleviate or, you know, elevate his. Uh, standing in the NHL because it's like oh wow you're doing that and you know the player of the week award and you know then you dig into the numbers and it's like holy you know like that line has just been spectacular beat well beyond everybody else so you know like I think that they've only been on the ice for 13 five on five goals this year and like scored over 50 like it's just ridiculously high the difference there and uh like they're i think they're all in the top 10 for plus minus and yeah it, it's just been in one spectacular line and i think that you know a lot of awards are going to be coming calgary's way yeah and obviously if the flames go as far as i think a lot of people in their destined for i think it's very likely that we get a con Smythe winner as well i'm not even going to predict that now but um i think that could definitely be coming the flames way I you, you already know who that's going to be, Lucic. <laughs> Last one was Al McInnes, 89 for the Flames. Yeah. Um, yeah, player name most valuable to his team in the playoffs. I could definitely see that being Goudreau. I could see that being any of that first line, actually. Yeah. But could yeah, be the th- goalie could be Anderson. Yeah. It's yeah, just... it could be the. It could. Be, I don't know if I don't know if Anderson would be seen as. Usually that award's going to the the high scoring forward. I found. Yeah, I know. In the last handful of years. Yeah. Um, I I think media wise, that's kind of what the league wants to show off. But I could see it being the goalie for sure. I could see it uh, being any of our top forwards. So I think this could be the year that we see the Flames really do well at the award ceremony. I don't think I can't think of a. I have to look at the numbers, but I don't think we're in line for Lady Bing. 
Which I well, especially after Gaudreau told off the ref the other day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I think that you know the gentlemanliness thing kind of went away there. I've always hated the name. At least just call it the Bing Memorial Trophy. Like the Lady Bing is not a trophy I want to win. Well, to be fair, like that was an actual person, and you know she donated she, the award. Yeah. So, you know, it, it does sound hokey if you're not familiar with hockey history and like you know it you know it, with being lady in it like it it's a little odd but you know different eras and the flames don't have anybody yeah. in line for calder memorial which for rookie of the year i mean the only guy that would really qualify is rujichka and he's not rookie of the year yeah uh art ross is for the player who leads the league in total points i don't think that's going to be us yeah James uh, by the way, uh, Maurice Cedar for Detroit is looking like he'll be the Calder Trophy guy, and he's uh, going to be one heck of a defenseman in this league. Just wanted the, to throw that out there because, you know. The yeah. James Norris Memorial Trophy is for the defenseman who demonstrates through the season the greatest all-round ability. I could see some of our defensive core getting this in a couple of years, but I'm not sure this is the year for Norris from this yeah. team. Um, I could see Anderson winning that in two, three years, but I don't think this is the year. Um, I never know about the Masterton Trophy. That's for the player who best exemplifies the qualities of preservation, sportsmanship, and dedication. Like, a lot of that stuff we don't see, um, yeah. you know, o outside the rink. Um, same thing with the Lindsay Trophy. So, I mean, there's other trophies this team could take home as well. The NHL Foundation Award. Um, but, you know, the, um, the other one that are, yeah... Yeah, those are really the only ones there. Um, maybe the Messi Award we might take home, but again, those really aren't there. Here's the question for you. If the Flames make it, let's say, past the second or third round, do you think the Tree would win the uh, Jim Gregory General Manager of the Year Award? I, I think that one's a shoe in for him regardless. Like, I think that, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd say regardless. I think if they uh, can make it past the first round, it is, because he's... He's built some first round teams. If he can't make it past yeah. first, well, it's, this year's uh, no, I think nothing that's spectacular. Voted before the season or the playoffs start. So, and like you look at the how like the team was last year, the Flames made a a rather large amount of adjustments, and each one of them fit the identity of the current team perfectly. They went out and got to Foley, who's blended in this team amazing. You know, like the only reason I could see them not, and that one I'm I'm just checking the website here. It's voted on by a 41 member panel that includes all 31 GMs, five NHL executives, and five media members. The only reason I could see them not giving that to Trees say, let's see what he does to get himself out of his cat mess. Yeah, like I think you're right. Well, He's probably and to be fair, like basically 32 general managers have a cat mess. <laughs> So that's you true. Know. That's true. Yeah, I, I could. That's one we've never obviously had somebody win that one. So that's one I could definitely see the Flames taking home as well. Yeah. Well, Matt, I think that wraps up this week. Why don't we look ahead to next week, shall we? Definitely. And you know, it's good to be able to talk about this team. It feels like they're finally coming into their own as a team, and like taking that next step, which. You know, we've flirted with over the years at times, but then, like, it quickly dissipated. Uh, you know, this is, like, the first time that, like, they've been looking good and then continually looking good. And so. I, I was actually going back and looking at some of our shows, you know, the last week of February, first week of March in the past. And at this point, at least the last three or four seasons, not including last season, last season was kind of weird. This team's always been notoriously bad after that week-long, whatever we want to call it, all-star break or bye week. And we're kind of talking about how we need to put be putting together six or seven wins to at least get into a playoff spot. Yeah. And, like, this team's level of focus and, frankly, anger <laughs> has been something else. Uh, you know, like, you're seeing Eat Bread raging on the wild, for example. Like, uh, that was you know something different i uh, never expected to see that from him as a player but you know it, it'll be interesting to see just uh how this team you know if they go into a lull again or you know the, 
the best uh, meme graphic I saw online about that Manjapani attitude. When you were a kid, did you watch the He-Man cartoons? Yeah. Do you remember when he'd pull the sword out and say, by the power of Grayskull? Yeah. I saw somebody put uh, Manjapani's face on him and it said, by the power of Vol- uh, of Sutter, I have the power. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like, um, Yeah, like it... it it's like, uh, who are you, and what have you done with the usual, you know, mild-mannered, nice guy, Manjapani? It's, like, it's almost it's, like Superman. By day, a mild-mannered reporter. Yeah. Um, but anyway, looking ahead to the next week. Last week, neither of us were right in our predictions. I predicted two wins, but I had the wrong two wins. I thought we'd win in uh, Winnipeg and Vancouver games, lose the Minnesota game. You thought we'd win all three, so... Um, Neither of us got that one right, but we have three yep. more games to predict this week. We're on the road again, which is something the Flames haven't said in a long time since the beginning of February. Tuesday night, the Flames are in Minnesota, a 6 p.m. Calgary start time, so note that one. That's earlier than we're used to. Then on Thursday, they're back here in the Saddle Dome for a 7 p.m. start time against the Montreal Canadien. That'll be the first time the building's been full in a while since before Christmas. Um, so expect, I mean, it's always a full building when Montreal's here, but expect a, a noisy building for that one. And then Saturday, they're on the road against the Colorado Avalanche in 8 p.m. start time. So two road games, one home game. What are you thinking, Matt? Six points. You're going, all, th- you're yep. going all three again. Yep. The win streak yeah. shall restart. Well, how would you say uh, this team needs to show that they – and, and you know, assert themselves against, you know, like Montreal, I think, is a given for both of us. Regardless. Do you think Toffoli lights up Montreal? Like, I'd love to see that. I'm love... honestly expecting a hat trick. Like, uh, yeah, I'd love to see, like, a hat trick and assist on whoever else gets a goal. Um, like, yeah. you know, he's got to be and all you know, over like, that Everybody's team. just going to be feeding. Here, Toffoli, score as many as you want. Please, here, take the puck. <laughs> is Pitlick playing in that? Is he, like, I don't even know what his status is knows uh but yeah no i I, i'm assuming that one regardless is a win uh but i think that uh because of how uh, the flames treated the first minnesota game as a playoff game i think you're going to see that same level of intensity from the team and you know and, and if they're playing that level of intensity against colorado too i think they're going to catch colorado flat footed a bit because you know, like, frankly, Colorado's not used to a heavy team coming and hitting them. <laughs> and I- I'm expecting full on that, like, everybody's going to be rock 'em sock 'em in that one. So, and I think, especially if you can wrap, you know, if you can pull out a big win against Montreal, I'd say 8 1, 7 2, something like that. I think that's a lot of momentum to ride into Denver. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah, and that's a Saturday night game. They've got a day on either side to recover, so I think that they've they'll definitely have some time to get ready for that one. Yeah, like I'm, I'm fully a- expecting that one to be a physical, nasty, nasty affair. You know, I think that when I look at the whole schedule for the month, that could be the game to watch. Like I think by yeah, the time we get to the here. second and third game against Colorado, we could see a banged up Flames team. I think that could be the game of the month. Yeah, I agree. That's the one I've already been penciled in of must watch <laughs> um i'm gonna go a little bit different than you i'm just looking at the schedule here i'm gonna say they win minnesota and they win montreal and i think they're gonna lose the first colorado game yeah and that is you know i was kind of coin tossing it but you know you're our eternal optimist matt well i believe in daryl Daryl does not do anything wrong. When I look Therefore, back at the season, you know, previews, you've thought we're going to win the cup since we started this 10 years ago. So, yeah, well, no, when we actually sucked, you know, I was realistic. Then you only thought we'd be Western Conference champions. No, for the first few years I was I was, you know, it wasn't really until this team had the talent level that they do that you know and have had for the last like four or five years that it's been like well you know based off the talent they should be doing something and then they fall flat on their face every time but you know daryl's not allowing them to do that so do you think we see dan vladar in net for any of these three games probably montreal yeah i'll go with that i yeah i'll go with that i 
I yeah. think a lot of times yeah. the coaching staff pencils these games in for the backup, you know, at the beginning of the year, and we all kind of knew Montreal would be lousy, so I can see them having penciled that one in. Yeah. It's one of those where, like, you could put the uh, Arseny Sergeyev or uh, Daniel Chechelev in there, and I think that the Flames would still win. Maybe that. that's the time you get your Dustin Wolf call off. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm teasing on that one, but I think – I think, as we said earlier, you got to get Valera going again. And I think putting him in for a big win like that, I mean, Dan hasn't been in for one of the Flames' big wins yet this season. Um, I think that could really help his confidence as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we that's about all we have to talk about this week. But as always, we'd love to hear what everyone else has to say, whether you want to dispute with us about something we've talked about, whether you want to agree with us, whether you have different thoughts on how this week's going to go, or uh, maybe you think that the Flames are in line for hardware that we don't. Uh, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You can, of course, get a hold of us on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're Fireside Chat. So Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. We're on YouTube. We're on Instagram. You can find us. The easiest way to find us on those is go to our website, firesidechat.ca, and all the links are at the very top. Um, and then while you're at the website, leave a comment on the show, or you can send us an, either an email or an audio message if you want to and let and give us your thoughts. And if you do want to give us an audio message, you can also phone us. We have a phone number. I haven't promoted it much this year, but our phone number is 403 768 2121. Again, that number is 403-768-2121. It's different than last year. We had some issues with our providers, so we had to change numbers. Um, but if you want to call us, don't worry, Matt and I won't pick up. Um, but you can leave us a voicemail, and we'd love to, to play your voicemail on the show and share your thoughts. Oh, and by the way, just uh, loop back. Um, you remember back that rant episode that I had when Glenn Gullitson was yes. coach? And it was basically a two-hour episode of me ranting, saying we need to hire, hire Daryl Sutter. I pretty much could have gone and got pizza and just left you here. Yeah. Well, th- this is why, you know. <laughs> like, ev- even then, I always have believed in Daryl Sutter, and he is making the most out of this team. So, you know. In, in Daryl you trust. Yep. Did then, do now. Let's go. <laughs> well, let's trust him through this week to get us six points. And Daryl, we trust. Yep. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.